Hello, everyone. It's Dan King and Lisa McEwen here with another fireside chat for you where we explore the human and strategic sides of business. Very excited to be with Justin Crane, financial advisor today. I've gotten to know Justin over the past little while and very excited to bring his brilliance and insightfulness to you today. So with nothing else needed to be said other than Justin, how are you? And tell us about the wonderful work you do in the world. I'm great. Thanks, Dan, for having me. Thanks, Lisa. It's the Dan and Lisa show. It is. Um, so my name is Justin Crane. I'm a financial advisor. I'm also a certified financial planner professional and do investment management and financial planning and also have an element in working with entrepreneurs and helping them get clear on the money side of their business, being strategic with the money, being proactive with it advising them how to work with bookkeepers, CPAs, attorneys, and all that good stuff. So I'm just, I'm a financial advisor. Like I love money. I like being strategic with it. And I'm stoked to be here and talk about that with you guys. I love that you're so straightforward about loving money, about being a financial advisor. Something yes. that I am curious about. Look, there are a lot of financial advisors out there. What's your special sauce? What makes you different from the other financial advisors that are floating around and this wonderful world of entrepreneurship. It's a great question. Uh, I just want to say that I am not different at all. I am 100% generic. I have no unique selling proposition. I have no edge and I don't know anything. Aside from that, um, my specialty is something called financial life planning. So it's like, how do you take what you really want for your life now and merge your money with it? So you can be more intentional and get what I call a return on life. Just an example. I helped a client of mine leave a job and adopt a kid wow. through financial planning and become a mom. So it's a little bit different than just, you know, like save, save, save. So you can have, you know, $82 billion when you're 91 and you can be like, great. But what about that road in between? What's fulfilling? What gives you purpose? What gives you that sense of return on life? I think it's both, you know, you got to do stuff today and you got to save for the future but why not enjoy the ride? And I have no problem with people buying an $8 cup of coffee at Starbucks. No problem at all. Starbucks? I'd rather go to the local cafe. Come on, I'm in Brooklyn. Okay. <laughs> Starbucks, pizza. Or, uh, do they have Blue no. Bottle out by you guys? They do. They yeah, do. Blue Bottle. You know, yeah. Justin, you play in such an interesting space because I think a lot of people tend to think of life and work as these two separate spheres. We bring a different version of ourselves. We're leading our company and thinking just about the company strategy. And then we go home and think about our family life. And I'm very intrigued by this like space that you carved out where life and work meet. Do you yes. find that when you get new clients, this is a difficult concept for them to understand how their personal life and their work life are actually one big life? Um, I actually think that they understand it, but they don't really know how it fits and how it works and like what's really happening. And, and they need clarity on it. Like basically they're overwhelmed. They're freaking out a little bit about money and they're being a little bit more reactive and not proactive. And they need to understand like that the business funds their personal life. Their personal life doesn't fund their business. Now I know that's a duh, like, of course we know that, but like, Everything from the client's business model to how they make money, to what their margins are, to how much cash they have, to what their profits are and all of that lingo. That's a function of how much money they can have personally and what they want to do with it. They get it, but they're not quite sure what to do and how to be strategic about it. Yeah. What they do with it is such a powerful, simple phrase. I think so many financial advisors don't think about broader life goals. They are unable to connect what we do with our money, how we can be intentional about carving out the life of our dreams, in part, I, I feel it's probably fair to say, tell me if you agree, because money is kind of like sex. It's one of those things that is tricky for people to, to talk about. It's a taboo subject in so many ways. And so, but it's so important. It helps us do all the things that we want to do in life. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think that, um, you know, going back to an, an entrepreneur, like, the value of someone's business is actually an asset, right? What could you sell it for? Well, if you're very profitable and you're consistently profitable and you want to monetize your business and get a big valuation or a sale, a lot of people don't even think about that. Why not be clear about how you can succeed in your business now, which would affect that valuation and then, you know, help you on your way. I have a sidebar question just 
uh, out of curiosity. Is that a real plant behind you, Lisa, or is that a fake plant? All real. Do you water that like once a day, once a like what's going no, on with that plant? No, this is about a once a week situation. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 all real. Wow, that kind of kinda looks like my hair uh, in the morning. That's that was the inspiration, Justin. The yeah. Wow. I like See, it. See, like you got to water your plant, you got to water your money, you got to take care of it, right? If you don't take yeah. care of the plant and the take care of the money, it's not going to grow. <laughs> yeah. You can't just let the sun hit it and be like you're done. You gotta like, you gotta get in there. You gotta put on, uh, you know, roll up your sleeves and like get going on that plant. Yeah, it, exposing the psychology of money is so important. Bringing it into the light of day, right? Because That's it's right. such a taboo subject. And yeah. do you find sometimes clients have shame or guilt around money? Do you find that uh, part of your work is is helping them understand their psychological relationship with money and how it might be different? Yeah. So when I start working with a client, I'm not going to be like, hey, I'm going to do an in-depth financial analysis on you and peel the layer of the onion 16 times and tell you when you were four, you had this bad experience with money and now you can't get anywhere. Like, I'm not going to do that. But I will peel the, the onion one layer. And sometimes when I do peel that layer, I do get a little teary eyed because that onion can get me a little emotional when I'm working with clients. But the thing is, is that a lot of times they'll repeat patterns that their parents did. Like they didn't put enough money away or they thought money was bad or they don't really want to talk about it. Um, I just did a call with a potential client where this husband and wife um, were uh, obviously married, but they had their own accounts and they really never have spoken about it as if what they want to do together. And they were coming to me to kind of like unite them. And then I started singing the song reunited because it feels so good. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm just kidding. I did not sing that. But my point is, is I can bring spouses together and get them on the same page and make them feel like they can work together and make progress together. I love that there's an element of therapy, even relationship therapy. Yeah. In the work that you I do. mean, I'm sending explanation of benefits to people. It's great. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. You know, something that I think about is sometimes what's best for our business is not always what's best for our personal life. Sometimes, especially when you talk about finances, we may have different sets of incentives for growing our business strategically versus yep. living this rich life. And I think it yes. gets increasingly more complex when a team is involved and they yes. have their own needs. How do you help people navigate that, you know, that complexity? Uh, my first answer is I have no idea. I literally, I have no clue. But here's why I don't have a clue, because it depends on everyone's situation and where their priorities are and what their goals are. Let's just go with a simple one. And I'm interested to hear, uh, Dan and Lisa, what your approach is. Let's say you're dealing with an entrepreneur and it's a seven figure entrepreneur and they have three people and they know that they need to hire an operations person and fill that role. And that role, let's just say, is a hundred thousand dollar salary. Right. So there's cash in the business to pay that salary for that ops person. You got to bring them in and they're going to be, you know, part of the 401k. So you have to do a profit sharing for that. There's some expenses there. You know, got payroll taxes. Um, maybe you want to add in a, a layer of professional development for them. And the next thing you know, in your mind, you're like, okay, I'm in for a hundred, but it's really 135,000. So now all of a sudden you're burning this 135 in cash. But over here on the left, is this the left or the right to me? Uh, this is the left to me, but it could be the right to you guys. On whatever side it is. You've got two kids that are going to college in three years and that 130 grand that you're paying that COO, you're now having to decide what is it that you're going to do? Are you going to pay to send your kids to college or let's say you want to buy a house, whatever the issue is, you've got to now deal with like, what's the priority? And then it's a question of well, what's the ROI on that cash? If you hire the COO, you might not have an ROI on the cash. Maybe it's in three years, right? So it's not like you can like, invest the hundred with the COO and make, make 200 grand in like four months and then bankroll that into the college. So it's so hard to answer the question. So what I do is I bring clarity to my client and be like, Hey, what's your priority? What is it that you want to do? And I'll give them advice. Like, look, you gotta, like, you have to send your kids to college because you want to, maybe you need to put the COO on hold for two years. But a lot of what I'm trying to do is facilitate people to have da -da -da -da, clarity clarity on what's going on so they could stop guessing and make decisions on what they really want. Yeah. 
so vital because entrepreneurship is such a fast changing game. We often struggle to understand what's going to happen next. And clarity may not solve all of our problems, but it at least helps us realize that, hey, in this fast moving world, we're going to have to slow things down sometimes and yeah. prioritize. Yeah. And so I think most I, I was really struck by your emphasis on proactive versus reactive planning, because for most of us, I mean, in an age of notifications going off constantly, we are so reactive, right? Totally. Which entrepreneurs are some of the, on average, some yeah. of the most reactive people I've ever met. How are you guys handling that with, with your clients where it's like they have to make a decision between, you know, A and B? How are you, um, how are you guiding them and advising them on what to do? You know, one of our focuses is, I, I think our focus may be a little narrower, like the range of decisions that we help our clients with may be a little narrower, but when we're helping them understand what's the ideal growth strategy, and there are three or four different directions that you could invest in, we do the research to uncover, this is the one that's likely to produce the ROI the fastest, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because per perhaps that answer may not be totally satisfactory, but I think it's a narrower range of decision points. But Lisa, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question because I think there's a lot of analysis and logic that you could put into that answer. So that's what Dan was speaking to. So we'll often, as he said, do the research, understand the market, understand the customers, really help a client identify out of my four options, this one option is going to make me the most money. This is where I'm going to outshine my competition. This is where customers are going to want the gifts that I have to give. And this is really where growth is going to be the easiest. But the thing that where it gets a little bit messy, and I'm sure you deal with this too, is that there's also an element of who the person is that's leading the company and mm -hmm. what are they going to stick to and what are their personal priorities. And at the end of the day, the best strategy in the world isn't going to come to fruition if the person isn't aligned. Yeah. So that is, it really does come down to what you said, clarity. We help our clients understand their options, understand the financial future, understand what this means for their business, and then make a choice. Um, yeah. And a lot of it does come down to also just communication. I think that the way that you talked about therapizing these spouses, yeah. we really help the leaders communicate with their teams, with their families, and understand what vision they're going to embark on. But it does start with a little bit of left brainy analysis. We're, yeah. we're nerds like that after all. We love our data. I love that. Speaking of data, we haven't talked about those three cool paintings behind you. Four. Four. Oh, sorry. I would talk about Dan's artwork, but I don't know. Dan does it. He has a very nice wall. It's very nice and very, you know, very flush and good. But it is about data. And those four pieces are awesome. I love them. Thank you. Uh, my sister's an artist. Yeah. So we have a nice dichotomy. She's the artist and I'm the business strategist. And Amazing. She, uh, this is kind of the four seasons. I don't know if you could. Oh, oh yeah, wait, that's you cool. Go. You have autumn, very summer, nice. spring, and winter. Yeah. yeah, I love it. So I'm very grateful. My whole house is adorned with beautiful custom artwork from my sister. That's awesome. Okay. What's, your yeah. art, what's your art situation? I got Israel. I got Italy. I got the Dead Sea. I got no. I don't have the. I have the Sea of Galilee. So the Sea of Galilee. Okay. I've been to Israel a few times. I lived in Italy for two years. Um, uh the, the guy in the far i don't know over there is my monody he's like my monody he's, he's called the rambam he's a very famous jewish philosopher yeah um when i just see that i'm like it gets me a little bit more like zen like what do i need to think about you know what are the things that are important to me like what am i trying to do like what's the deal mm -hmm. um so um which gets me back to this point that you're talking about about the left brain and then communication and alignment it's it's really about like making a decision, right? And giving advice and then seeing what the client's gonna do and how they make decisions and if they're ready to change or they're like, they got a noodle on it for a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes people don't make decisions really quickly and sometimes they do because they're ready and they just are like, Justin, tell me what to do. I'm like, all right, I'm cool with that. You know, one of the big changes I've noticed recently and I'm, I'm curious what both of you guys think as we think about this process of giving advice to clients and helping them achieve clarity, it's one thing to state some advice. It's another thing to increase the odds that advice is actually followed. And hopefully mm -hmm. if we're giving advice, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. There is something really powerful about 
how you conclude the tone, not just with which you give advice, but especially the tone with which that last piece of advice, and when you were wrapping up, whatever it is we're saying, ending on a strong note. You know, I've noticed with Zoom, because we're not in person with most of our clients, and sometimes we're in a very intimate conversation where we're talking about a challenging subject, and the dynamics would be different if we were in person. But over Zoom, I've noticed recently just looking into that camera is equivalent to looking into someone's eyes and ending with a truth that you know is going to be challenging, but not wrapping up with unnecessary verbiage, which in turn both clouds the specific things you're saying, as well as weakens the emotional impact of the advice. And our clients, particularly when they're in that moment when they want confidence and strength from us, we need to show up powerfully. And instead of saying, you know, at the end of our advice, or instead of saying something small like, and, and so that's what I think, when we can just state the truth, even when we know that it might be difficult to swallow, and end our sentences with a strong period, it's a small thing, but I've noticed it makes a big difference in the likelihood that clients will actually act on the advice. Wow. We should just end right there. Mic drop. That was bold. That was awesome. That was great. Thank you. I don't know. Do you, do you think at all about these dynamics of, you know, when we're interacting with a client, we can do all the substantive research. We can know our shit. That's table stakes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But do you mm -hmm. think about how exactly you present what you say? Or do well, you just you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be vulnerable incoherently. I don't know. No, I'm going to be vulnerable here. Yeah. So I, at times, like I have no problem giving advice and have, I have no problem saying this is what you need to do. Um, and if I feel the need to really be direct, I will like, I will. Okay. I'm not going to give an example. I will. But what I found that has worked for me in this advice business is having the client own some of the process and do some of the process so that they can then see themselves the outcome of which they really need to do. So when I build a financial plan with a client, I actually, with them, I input all of the data, I input all of the assumptions. And yes, those are like little pieces of the puzzle. And I really like the picture of the cover of the box, which is the most important piece of the puzzle. But if I can get them to own part of that process and see all of the variables that go into it, yeah. then at the end, when it comes time to give that mic drop piece of advice, I feel like I don't have to be as bold and be like, you need to do this. They've already kind of seen and gotten it as we're getting to the end of that ninth inning baseball game. By the yes. way, I've never played baseball with any clients. I don't know why I'm saying that. But my point is, is that it, they, they're kind of through with it. And they're like, you know what? You're taking me on this, like this exploration. I yeah. see that I really need to do this. Yeah, it's it's a journey in which you're equipping them with the tools. You're, you're teaching them how to fish, right? And that's yeah. so rewarding. And they need to own part of that decision and see for themselves why, why they need to make that decision, you know, but I do see where you guys are coming from. Like, yeah, it's important to give that advice and to be direct and to try to do it on zoom or whatever is important. Um, I'm still figuring that out, but I'm involving the client a little bit more um, on my end to get them to see what they need to do. There's a word that we often use with our clients, co-creation, and that's been very helpful, I think, for the type of work we do where we are helping them see the direction of their company. Similarly to the type of work you do, we can't just, we can't just tell them. Yeah. We, you can never just tell them. It's, it is a journey and it is a collaboration. It is a co-creation. What we can do is provide that clarity, provide that data, and then work together with them to achieve the outcome that they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Amen. So once you can, I'm curious about the journey of a client in your world. So it sounds like you help them understand this vision. You help them implement. You've taught them how to fish. But once they know how to fish, kind of what does it turn into? What does the long term look like? Yeah. What is the outcome that they get? Massive accountability. I mean, like, half of my stuff is accountability, like the things that they need to do. So um, it, you know, you've heard the expression, you know, you're driving from LA to New York, you need a map, 
the weather's going to change. You're going to need a roadmap. You got to check and see where you're at. You have to course correct. All of that um, is important. I think um, if we're just looking at entrepreneurs and what are the things that can get them off path, probably the easiest thing for me to help them with and the easiest thing, in my opinion, that gets them off path are taxes because that, that's involving a CPA and most CPAs are very reactive. They're looking at your P&L from the past um, and they're looking at your estimated tax payments that you had to make last year based on last year's numbers. But, you know, here we are in you know mid-March and CPAs are working on corporate returns for 2021. I know I'm kind of dating it here, but sorry. But, but my point is, is that I'm interested in, well, how's the first quarter going for your business? And how much profits do you have and how much you have to set aside for taxes on that or what's your payroll that you have to do so that's an example where it's never it's never you're never really done you're always needing to see how much you're making and what you need to set aside or blah 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 so it's accountability and i'm just using taxes as an example because no one really wants to deal with taxes until you know they have like <laughs> it's just brutal but but you know, as a financial advisor, if my client has 300 grand in the bank, well, how much of that is really theirs? And how much of that is the IRS's and the state, whatever? Yeah. Well, again, you're very proactive. That thing comes back. So yeah. something I'm curious about is for your own practice, your own business, what do you envision as the future? What are you excited? What are you planning? Okay. So I'm excited. Um, so my business model is basically financial planning fees and investment management fees. It's very, very scalable. And my costs don't go up when my sales go up. So I envision hiring another person, having that person be a COO and help me. I've looked at hiring a financial advisor, you know, managing the investments. And I've said no to that um, because there's a lot of um, risk that I would take on if that financial advisor gives bad advice you know, get sued by a client, steals money, who, whatever it is, I'm on the hook for that. So I've gone down the path of not doing that. And I've just it, tried to increase the, you know, the average lifetime expectancy or lifetime value of a customer or something like that. So I've said no to a financial advisor. I've said yes to more support staff and more strategic. Um, I've also, you know, raised some prices. So what I envision, if I can con continue to grow and just compound, I see a business that has a few more people staff wise. I don't see myself retiring. Um, I see myself elevating my brand a little bit more. It's good. You know, my, my tagline is uniting money with life and business. And that's exactly what we've been talking about. But I think I could do more, maybe an element of philanthropy. Um, I don't see myself selling, although these multiples of EBITDA and earnings are insane. What we can sell for it crazy. Um, but to answer your question, if, if I haven't, I looked at a five-year and a 10-year plan on um, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Like right now, I manage 180 million bucks in assets. And if I continue to grow, that number would be huge, like approaching 400 million, 500 million bucks, I mean, it's half a billion dollars. It's insane. It's crazy. So, um, and I'm like, oh my God, like me? Like me, Justin from like, LA who used to play tennis is doing this, but yeah, yeah, F yeah, you know, but, and I'll make mistakes along the way. And, you know, like there's drama along the way and all of that, but it's, it's really interesting to see that if you can consistently grow, even at a decent rate, the success that you can have. Yeah. When you're, when you're doing the work that you're meant to be doing, right. Growth is just a beautiful thing to watch. You guys. Hmm. Where do you see yourselves if you were to look out five years and come back to today? Yeah. What do you see the changes in the growth in your business and your brand? Yeah, you know, a, a big thing for us, we've been a consulting company for a couple of years and we love supporting our clients. And it struck us about half a year ago that we could continue doing that. And we don't envision ourselves building a massive consulting company where kind of like you, we looked at the possibility of hiring other people right? At hiring more consultants. And we thought we want to grow. That's not how we want to grow. Mm -hmm. We realized that our skill sets are really potentially effective uh, in a PE context, building a yeah. PE fund, becoming owners of the companies that we consult for, right? Is a way for us to support them in a deeper way. 
we can be even more involved. We can have a bigger impact and, you know, we can be rewarded financially even more for it. And so when we think about the private equity industry, it hasn't always been the most human centric industry. It hasn't always been the most long term minded. And so for us, building a private equity company that honors the humanity of the employees of portfolio companies and thinks about respecting all the stakeholders involved and growing these companies in the long term, that really gets us going. Cool. But coming back to you is the interview subject, Justin, as we... We had no comment from Lisa. That was just like, like there's zero. Lisa, give, it, give us a 10. Dancing, I know Dan, it's about to me. To be honest, but... Dan and I talk so much about this vision. We have this thing that we call the Danisa hive mind. It's Wait, the scary... Danisa? Like the Danisa Dan hive mind. So sometimes we answer on behalf of the other, or we give you this like merger of an answer. So to be honest, I have very, I don't have that much to add. I agree with Dan. I think that our intention is to continue to serve our consulting clients very well. We love being a small shop because they don't just get a, you know, yeah. to be honest, a, a random analyst yeah. from somewhere doing their work. They get sure. us and we're specialists in this <clears throat> but at the same time we're really interested about the world of investments in pe and we're going to continue to explore that continue to grow as a business and as people that's cool yeah. game on as we come towards the end of our time together justin we're curious we always love to end on a human note which is by asking so when you're not doing this awesome work that you do what's fun do you still play tennis what what other stuff do you do <clears throat> you like working um really exercising like I did during COVID I got into running like four miles five miles six I got up to ten then my knees like killed me so I'm back to three or four um I do orange theory as well I like that I love coffee and um I love um a good bottle of wine I'm going to talk into this bottle of wine this is it's a mic this is my wine mic you know I like a good bottle of wine good glass of wine um reading and um like i'm gonna be 50 in july it's insane i thought oh. I, I still think i'm like 12. it's weird but i want to learn so i'm gonna i want to learn more about how to be a good financial advisor i want to learn more about my heritage i want to learn more about um i don't know management and psychology and all of that so i'm doing a little bit of reading um i'm trying to do the netflix thing and i, I am watching some shows but like after five minutes i fall asleep I just, I'm done. Like 9 30, 10 o'clock. I, I, I'm watching uh, Ozark, right? At yeah. Season four. I'm out in 10 minutes. Out, cold. So I'm doing my stuff in the morning, 5 30, quarter of six. That's my time when I do my growth stuff. Sounds like a pretty good life. I am so lucky. I am so lucky to have this life. I am uber lucky. And, um, you know, I'm grateful. Your sense well, of gratitude really comes through. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Or do you want to go ahead, Lisa, and wrap us up? No, it looked like you were tearing up over there, Dan. Getting emotional over well, Justin's well, gratitude. Justin has that effect on me. I got to say, he has that effect on me. Um, let's say, Justin, we're, we're grateful for this interview. It was a ton of fun. Love the freewheeling spirit that you bring. Love your groundedness and your sense of humor. And Thank always you. learn a ton from our conversation. So very grateful for this time. Thank, Thank you. you, Dan. Thank you, Lisa.